on tonight's summary of the Israel-Hamas War, Day 162. More details released about Hamas's proposal for a hostage deal. The Israeli government is debating its response and is expected to send delegates to Qatar to continue negotiations. The first humanitarian aid ship arrives in the Gaza Strip, officially beginning the maritime corridor to allow the entrance of humanitarian aid. UNICEF publishes a report stating that one out of every 20 children in the Gaza Strip is suffering from the most acute hunger conditions and is thin in a life-endangering way. While the first Friday of Ramadan passes in the Al-Aqsa Mosque peacefully, a Palestinian Imam carries out a shooting attack in the areas of Hebron. Amidst the rivalry between different Palestinian factions about the next Palestinian Prime Minister, the Fatah movement lashed out at Hamas today, accusing it of the worst catastrophe to befell the Palestinians and stating that it launched the October 7th adventure and led to the reoccupation of the Gaza Strip by Israel. Hello everyone, I'm Alon Burstein, a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the summary of the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas War. It is currently the evening of March 16, 2024 in the United States, the morning of March 17, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the Hadza situation, more details were released today about what Hamas included in its proposal for the first phase of the hostage deal. Regarding the hostages' identities, it included the release of five IDF female soldiers, seven women who are held in captivity, 15 older men, and 13 injured or sick younger men. As I stated yesterday, in exchange for their release, Hamas is demanding the release of some 250 Palestinian prisoners, including 150 prisoners who are considered heavy prisoners, i.e. those who are sentenced for life in prison or over extended jail time, and there's another 600 to 800 Palestinian prisoners, as well as the other terms of the truce, complete freedom of movement of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, and the entrance of humanitarian aid into the Strip. Hamas has yet to state which hostages are alive and which are not, which is one of the terms that Israel stated is required in order to proceed with the deal. As a reminder, the IDF has confirmed that 34 out of the 134 hostages that are held in the Gaza Strip are in fact dead. Some reports suggested that Israel and U.S. intelligence estimate that 20 more hostages may be dead already. However, this has not been confirmed, I will add, or denied by the IDF. Other news related to the Hazza situation, CNN reported today that the head of the Israeli Mossad, Dedi Barnea, will travel to Qatar on Monday to continue the hostage negotiations. In Israel, the War Cabinet and the Expanded Cabinet are due to meet one after the other tomorrow evening. On the agenda is determining the parameters for the negotiating team that is due to head to Qatar on Monday. Only after these parameters are decided upon will Netanyahu approve Dedi Barnea's travel for the negotiations. Amidst this, it was reported today that Minister Gantz and Minister Eisenkot, both members of the War Cabinet, tried to reach Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu on, in order to discuss the hostage deal on Saturday. However, the Netanyahu refused to talk to them. Meanwhile, there are conflicting reports about the expectations from the negotiations in Qatar. In Israel, some officials stated that there are big obstacles in Hamas's demands, specifically the complete freedom of movement of Palestinians towards the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, which Israel fears is going to allow Hamas to completely rebuild itself in the north, as well as Hamas's demand for the amount of Palestinian prisoners to be released, and the movement's demands that it will select which prisoners are in fact released. At the same time, some optimism was noted regarding Hamas's seeming willingness to initiate a hostage deal, i.e. to have a first phase of the deal include a six-week truce and hostage exchange, and postponing Hamas's original demand that any deal include a complete ceasefire and idea of withdrawal to the later phases of negotiations. Responding to all these developments, Israel's finance minister and head of religious designers in Bezal Smotrich stated today that he calls upon Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to cancel the Israeli delegation to Qatar and order the IDF to immediately invade Rafah as a mechanism of increasing pressure on Hamas in order to achieve victory and return, return the hostages. According to reports in Israel, Netanyahu appears willing to send a delegation to Qatar, although different Israeli sources cited that the order of events that are going to happen in Israel, which is convening the war cabinet, and only after that convening the expanded cabinet, appear to be Netanyahu setting up a political collision as the war cabinet is clearly going to determine what is going to be the parameters of negotiations, Later in the evening tomorrow, Smotrich and Ben Gvir are going to voice their disapproval, which may end up postponing negotiations as the cabinet has to reconvene. There's a lot of speculation about if Netanyahu actually wants a deal or does not want a deal at this time. There was fear that the United States that Netanyahu is going to reject a deal. Right now, what appears to be very clear is that Israel is going to send a delegation to Qatar to continue negotiations. However, whether the delegation is going to be allowed to actually negotiate, i.e. to offer from Israel's side, remains to be seen. 
Moving on to the Gaza Strip, there was a barrage of rockets sent from the Gaza Strip targeting the southern areas of Israel today, specifically the areas of Nachal Oz. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, there were very few reports today about the actual fighting on the ground. Amidst the highlights from what happened today, in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, there was ongoing bombing that was reported in the Jabalia refugee camp. However, there was little reports about the results of these bombings. In the central parts of the Gaza Strip, the IDF published a summary today stating that in the past two weeks, over 250 Hamas and other terror operatives have been killed in the area. The report states that the raids were carried out from the Nitzarim, or Nusirat Corridor, that is the main corridor that divides the Gaza Strip from north to south that the IDF is maintaining, and that these raids are continuing in the adjacent areas. Amidst this, the al Qassam Brigades, that is Hamas's military wing, published a video today showing that the group fired RPGs at IDF vehicles in the central camps of the Gaza Strip. There are no reports about the results of these confrontations. In addition to this, Palestinian sources reported today that seven Palestinians were killed and ten were wounded in an IDF airstrike targeting a house in the Al-Nusirat refugee camp in the central parts of the Gaza Strip. The IDF reported earlier in the day that a bombing was carried out against an area where Hamas operatives were held up in the central camps, so it may be the same bombing that the IDF is stating was carried out against a, an area that Hamas operatives were held up, and that Palestinian sources are reporting that seven Palestinians were killed and ten were wounded. In the, in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip in Hanunis, airstrikes were reported against weapons warehouses in the areas of Hanunis. El Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, that is the military wing of Fatah, reported detonating explosive devices near IDF forces in the area of Hamid City. However, again, compared to the last several weeks, there were very scarce reports today regarding what actually happened on the ground. Other news related to the Gaza Strip. The Quds News Network, which is a Hamas affiliate, reported today that Yusuf Muhammad Abu Jazar, who is a senior officer in the Hamas-run Rafah police force, died from the injuries he sustained after his vehicle was attacked a month ago by the IDF. This is part of the IDF attacks against the police force in Rafah, which in turn contributed to the breakdown of humanitarian aid entering into the Gaza Strip. Likely this was being done as part of the IDF's plans to invade the town of Rafah. In addition to this, in response to the announcement yesterday that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu approved Rafah invasion plans, al Arabi al-Jadid quoted the Egyptian sources today stating that Cairo has received assurances from Israel that if the IDF launches an operation into Rafah, Egypt's concerns about Palestinian uprooting and casualties will be taken into consideration. In the last several weeks, it has been reported that Israel has been negotiating with Egypt. Egypt's main concern is that the IDF pushing into Rafah is going to lead to the upwards of 1 to 1.5 million internally displaced Palestinians to try to flee over the border into Egypt. There's been different reports that Egypt has been setting up a refugee town within the areas adjacent to the border, the Gazan border. However, these are somewhat unconfirmed. There's been all kinds of reports that the IDF has concluded its plans to set up humanitarian islands and evacuate Palestinian civilians into other areas in the Gaza Strip. However, Egypt is still concerned, and also all these reports are being, are being stated. No timetable has actually been initiated regarding what is going to happen in the invasion of Rafah. According to some reports, when the IDF does begin to evacuate civilians from Rafah, that unto itself is going to take at least two weeks before any ground invasion may begin. Other news, the Wall Street Journal published a report today about the buffer zone that the IDF is reportedly creating on the Gazan side of the border with Israel. The report states that the IDF has continued the flattening operations that were reported well over a month ago and has destroyed hundreds of homes and buildings in the region adjacent to the Israeli border, as well as flattening extensive farmland. According to reports, all this is meant to create this buffer zone. The reports add that since the beginning of the war, the IDF declared a 300 meter region adjacent to the Israeli border as a no go zone for Palestinians, and it was expected that this 300 meter region is going to be the buffer zone. However, according to satellite images, the flattening operations appear to expand over 800 meters into the Gaza Strip. Regarding casualties, no IDF soldiers reported killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, leaving the total number of IDF soldiers killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 249. Four IDF soldiers were reported injured in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. The total number of IDF soldiers injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began is 1,480. The Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip is reporting that 63 Palestinians were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, bringing the total number of Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to 31,553. 73,546 Palestinians are reported injured in the Gaza Strip since the war began, and there are still several thousand Palestinians that are buried under the rubbles of the different bombings and are presumed dead.
Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, UNICEF published a report today referencing a study that was conducted in the Gaza Strip stating that one out of every 20 children in the Gaza Strip is suffering from the most acute and extreme levels of hunger and that these children are thin in a life-threatening way. The situation in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip is described as the worst, with children under the age of two noted as particularly affected by these conditions. The report also references the speed in which things deteriorated, stating that the amount of children in this condition nearly doubled since January, and this is referenced specifically with an eye to the future, stating that if the situation continues, it's not just these children that the report is referencing that are in danger, but the situation is likely to increase and multiply. Other news, the Palestinian sources reported that one person was killed and another was injured as a result of crushing conditions, the amount of people that were stuffed into one area, while waiting for an aid power dropping in the areas of Beit Lahia in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Amidst this, the Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip reported that the number of people who died from the aid truck incident that are reported between Thursday and Friday night has gone up to 36. Earlier, it was reported that the Palestinian Health Ministry was stating that number at 21 Palestinians who were killed, while other local sources were stating the number was 40. The Palestinian Health Ministry is now confirming that the number is 36. Other news related to the humanitarian situation. The ship Open Arms is on its way back to Cyprus after it delivered its first shipment of humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip, with a pilot run of unloading and distributing aid through this maritime corridor being declared a success. The president of Cyprus, Nikos Christodoulos, stated that the second ship is awaiting in, is awaiting to set sail in the port of Garnica. According to reports, the second ship is carrying some 240 tons of food and humanitarian aid, and is also going to deliver two forklifts and a crane in order to facilitate with future operations of unloading ships in this maritime corridor. Other news, Germany officially joined the countries that are paradropping aid into the Gaza Strip, and in a joint mission with France, paradropped four packages of one ton each, packed primarily with flour and rice. Other news related to the humanitarian situation, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu announced in cabinet that he is considering appointing a special coordinator to manage the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. Historically, the appointment of such coordinators in Israel, this includes the coordinator for hostage release in Israel, Gal Hirsch, or also historically the coordinator uh, for the COVID pandemic, have essentially meant removing authority fr from specific ministries and placing them under the Prime Minister's office since the coordinator is appointed by the Prime Minister and therefore authority is removed from the ministry that was in charge and comes under the auspices of the Prime Minister's office. In this case, what this will mean is removing the authority for managing humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip from the Ministry of Defense, Yoav Gallant, and instead of placing it under the office of the Prime Minister under Benjamin Netanyahu. It remains to be seen if this actually will happen, but this is an indication of the mistrust between Netanyahu and Gallant that has been reported upon in the last several weeks. Moving on to the West Bank, there was a, a Palestinian attack that was carried out in the town of Hebron. A shooting was carried out targeting a Jewish settlement in the area. According to reports, the attacker, Sheikh Mahmoud Nofil, is the imam of the al qassam Mosque in the city and a Hamas operative. No one was injured in this attack, and according to reports, he was shot and killed. Regarding IDF activity, the IDF carried out a covert operation in the Dehaisha refugee camp near Bethlehem. Laith El Atarash, a wanted Palestinian in the area, was arrested, and pictures and video footage disseminated by Palestinians showed the footage from security cameras that he was arrested in a falafel stand by undercover units. In addition to this, IDF activity was also reported in a variety of different areas in the West Bank. These include the areas of Hebron, Tubas, Tulkarem, Bethlehem, Nablus, and Janine. The Palestinian Prisoner Society reported that 20 Palestinians were arrested in the West Bank in the last 24 hours. The IDF did not report how many people it has registered as it arrested. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, there were barrages of rockets and missiles sent from Lebanon targeting the northern parts of Israel in the last 24 hours. Rockets were fired toward the areas of Hardov, Malachia, and Misgav Am. Other rockets targeted the areas of Rechis Ramim, Kiryat Shmona. Hezbollah specifically noted that it fired two Burkan missiles in the barrage towards Kiryat Shmona. In addition to this, a suspicious aerial target was intercepted by Israel off the coast of Akko. No details were given regarding what this target was, it was likely a Hezbollah drone. Hezbollah also claimed responsibility for six different border incidents that is usually attacks against different IDF outposts in the last 24 hours. Regarding IDF activity, IDF warplanes attacked Hezbollah military structures in the areas of Misa Jabal and Meruhin, and lookout posts were targeted in the areas of Meruhin as well. In addition, sources in Lebanon reported that IDF attacks were also carried out in the areas of Kila, Adaharia, and Tirherfa. 
Other news, in Syria, a rocket was reportedly fired from the Syrian regions towards the Golan Heights in Israel. According to reports, it failed to cross the border. Hours later, the IDF reported artillery fire towards the D- Dara region, with some reports stating that it was targeting the city of Neve, which is the area from which the rocket was launched. Several hours later, an IDF attack was also reported in the outskirts of Damascus. The Syrian Human Rights Observatory stated that two military sites near the Kalmon Mountains were attacked, with one of the targets reportedly being a weapons shipment. The Syrian military announced that one Syrian soldier was also injured in the attack. The IDF or Israel made no comments about these operations. Moving on to some of the regional developments, Al Ahbar, which is a Lebanese Hezbollah affiliate, published a report today quoting Houthi military sources. After the announcement that the Houthis made yesterday about expanding their activity and targeting Israeli-affiliated ships in the Indian Ocean, the sources reportedly stated that this is only the first phase of the Houthi escalations, and the next phase the Houthis intend to include targeting U.S. and U.K. ships in the Indian Ocean. In the statement that was made yesterday, and you can see my report yesterday on this, the Houthis stated that they are going to target any ship that is affiliated with Israel, not only passing through the Red Sea, but also any ship that is trying to pass in the longer passage through the Cape of Good Hope, i.e. bypassing all of Africa, now reportedly they are intending to escalate these attacks to also attack any US or UK ships that are trying to bypass the Red Sea through the longer passage as well. Other news, the US Central Command reported that that a Houthi drone was intercepted in the Red Sea, and that another drone crashed in the area. In addition, five more uncrewed sea vessels were also reportedly attacked and destroyed. In addition to this, after I reported yesterday that UK MTO had reported an explosion near a ship in the Red Sea, the US Central Command reported today that the Houthis fired three nautical ballistic missiles at ships in the Red Sea. No reports were given about any damage. The ships, presumably, continued on course. Other news, El Miyadin quoted Palestinian sources today, stating that there was a meeting last week between delegates of Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and the Houthis. According to the report, this meeting, which is somewhat unprecedented between these different factions, focused on the next stage of escalations in in the event that the IDF invades Rafah and, in general, on coordinating between the sides. This comes amidst different reports that are leading into Ramadan, different different units or actors within the what's called the resistance movements were going to further coordinate their different attacks. Hamas stated previously that it is going to be involved in negotiations of releasing the crew of ca- a captured ship that the Houthis had captured and are currently being held hostage. This means that they are trying to elevate their relationship and bring the Houthis more into the war diplomatically, in addition to the Houthis' military support of them, If this meeting did in fact occur, it is somewhat unprecedented and remains to be seen how this will impact the entire region and the trajectory of the war. Moving on to some of the political and general trends from the last 24 hours, there's continued political turmoil in Israel which is likely to impact the way the war develops. Minister Gidon Saar, after splitting from the party of Benny Gantz, who is a member of the war cabinet, issued an explicit ultimatum today stating that if he is not giving a position in the war cabinet himself in the coming days, he will resign from the government. Now, it's important to note that Saar now leads a four-person party and his resignation is not going to be enough to threaten the government's survival. However, his resignation will be a blow to Prime Minister Netanyahu's government. Netanyahu is likely going to try to find a way to placate Saar while Benny Gantz is refusing to allow him into the war cabinet Regardless of how this plays out, it is going to have an impact on the way the war is run and on the relationship between the different cabinets in Israel. Other political news, which also relates to the future of the Gaza Strip. After yesterday, Hamas rejected the appointment of Mohammed Mustafa as the new Palestinian prime minister that is supposed to bring together a unity government and reunite the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Today, the Fatah movement answered Hamas in an unprecedented diplomatic attack. Fatah accused Hamas for recklessly launching October 7th and bringing catastrophe upon the Palestinians, stating, and I quote, We are astonished by the divisive language of Hamas and wonder with who the Pal- who in the Palestinian leadership did Hamas consult before embarking on the October 7th adventure, which led to horrendous and, cat- and catastrophic disasters worse than the Nakba of 1948. With who in the Palestinian leadership is Hamas consulting while it now negotiates with Israel and offers concession after concession with no aim other than guaranteeing the personal safety of Hamas leaders? 
Escalating further, Fatah also accused Hamas of cooperating with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to preserve the division within the Palestinian arena, adding, and I again quote, Those who caused the reoccupation of the Gaza Strip by Israel and the Nakba the Palestinians are currently experiencing in Gaza cannot presume to dictate the national interests of the Palestinians. Fatah also continued to state that while Muhammad Mustafa is a national leader, Hamas would like to see the appointment of a Palestinian prime minister that will be done either by Iran or to simply have Tehran uh, be appointed to govern the Palestinians, and it continued to chastise the external Palestinian leadership as well. It stated, and again I quote, It appears that they live a life of luxury in seven-star hotels and are blind to justice. We wonder why the majority of the Hamas leadership is abroad, and why them and their families fled, leaving the Palestinian people defenseless to deal with a cruel war. So this is the most unprecedented escalation in rhetoric between Fatah and Hamas, with Fatah actually accusing Hamas not only of cooperating with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, but also of leading the Palestinians to the catastrophe that Israel has then, in turn, reoccupied the Gaza Strip. This is a severe blow to the negotiations between the two sides. Two, a little over two weeks ago, there was a reconciliation meeting of different Palestinian factions in Russia that was supposed to bring together the Palestinian factions to create a unity government that would, in turn, be able to assume some control of the Gaza Strip in the future. It remains to be seen if now Hamas will accept some cooperation with the Palestinian Authority or refuse this cooperation and how and what impact this will have on the vision that the United States is trying to create in order to have a regional deal that will lead to a future Palestinian state, but that one of the first steps of that is a revitalized Palestinian Authority that can actually take control of the region. If you enjoyed these reports, please do remember to give them a like, subscribe, turn on notifications if you want to know when reports come out. If you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. If you'd like me to put out specific videos about different topics, leave them in the comment section below as well. That is my report for the last 24 hours. I'll be back tomorrow.